Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. I actually wasn't... I was wondering if I was going to make this video, but... This is sad. I mean, granted, I never met the guy. Never talked to the guy. God would not have known I existed and all that jazz. But at the same time, I was a fan of quite a few of his movies. I think he was a solid director. I think he had a pretty decent filmography under his belt. And when you watch interviews and you watched him talk, he always seemed like a nice guy. He always seemed like a pretty decent guy. For example, there's this thing called Dinner for Five that was done years and years ago where John Favreau would get a group of people for dinner and just talk the business. And there's one with Richard Donner and Michael Madsen is part of the, the dinner. And Richard Donner's wife, Lauren Schuler Donner, she was a producer. She produced some of the X-Men movies. She produced Volcano. She produced, I think, Mr. Mom. And she produced films like Free Willy, which Michael Madsen was in. And Michael Madsen tells a story about, as he's talking with Richard Donner, you know, he got this part. It usually plays the bad guy, but this seemed like, you know, playing the dad in Free Willy, good guy. And then he, he tells a story about he walked up and said, you sure there's nothing else in the script I don't know about? What do you mean? Like, uh, I don't know, like, this dad, he goes crazy and insane and he, like, cuts Free Willy's, you know, he cuts Willy's blowhole or something. I just remarked, like, when he cut the ear of Reservoir Dogs, like, am, am I going to cut Willie? It's, again, just type in Dinner for Five Richard Donner or Dinner for Five Michael Madsen on YouTube. You'll find it. So, And Richard Donner is is uh, fun in that dinner. It seemed like a very nice guy. And I guess the... Really, the only way I knew of him is from his movies. So to tell about some of the movies of his I liked, I guess sort of a, a top ten of my favorites. Number one would be Lethal Weapon. The first Lethal Weapon. So I was thinking, like, would it be Superman? I do really like Superman. That's in the top five. Uh, but, you know, I do like Scrooge, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the first Lethal Weapon, to me... It had a great combination of the humor, the action, the edge. You have Bill Gibson, Danny Glover, Riggs and Murtaugh. You have great score by Michael Kamen and Shane Black did a nice job on the script. You really felt sorry for Mel Gibson's character. You felt pity for Danny Glover's character being too old for this shit. Uh, I even like the villains. I mean, you got Gary Busey in there. Uh, the Christmas motif, which is usually a Shane Black novelty. Uh, Tom Atkins is involved in the film. I like the song at the end, Honeymoon, Honeymoon Suites, Lethal Weapon. Which, actually, I was listening to that today. It's a very good song. Uh, weird sort of side note. Uh, when I was growing up, I had the Lethal Weapon films taped on a VHS tape. And so, I had about three films, the first three on one VHS, and it would cut off during the end credits. So, for years and years and years, I never knew there was a fucking theme song for Lethal Weapon. I never even, I've seen Lethal Weapon so many times, but I never knew about that song because when the end credits start, it's this Christmas song, and then it goes into Honeymoon Suites Lethal Weapon theme. And the tape would cut off to go to Lethal Weapon 2. So it wasn't until I got the DVD, I think mean, years and years later, where I watched it, I guess I was just looking at the credits. I'm like, what is this song? When you lose your love, because you're a lethal weapon. I'm like, wow, fuck. This song's been in this movie? It's a pretty good song. I'm going, I'm going to embarrass myself here. My first channel, my very first channel on YouTube, I'll embarrass myself. 
being very early on, not even thinking of doing movie reviews, I did tributes. And not knowing shit about how to do it, it started with still pictures. So I have like a song and I just have still pictures. And that was a Raphael and April O'Neil like uh, <laughs> tribute video. It's embarrassing. I don't know what the fuck I was smoking. I don't even smoke, but I, I think it's like I like this song. I was in a Ninja. Well, I'm still a Ninja Turtle fan, but especially at that time, I was in a big phase for it. So I just put it in there. Part of me wishes that a lot of those videos were still up, just out of curiosity. But I guess again, just share my own memories of Lethal Weapon. These are not reviews of the films; it's just again, memories. And Richard Donner. Like I said, he he worked with the team well because he came back for all four films. And Lethal Weapon is one of those franchises that usually in franchises people disappear. People leave. People get killed off. Uh, this is one of the few franchises where people kept getting added. Because Lethal Weapon 2, you had Joe Pesci. Lethal Weapon 3, you had Rene Russo. Lethal Weapon 4, you had Chris Rock. I know there's also Lethal Weapon 5. I don't think you needed Lethal Weapon 5. I, you're definitely not getting it now. But yeah, the, the first one, I thought that the tone was very consistent. And Ridge was a badass. I particularly liked the scenes in the director's cut. Which I know the theatrical, the theatrical cut of Lethal Weapon is technically Richard Downs' director's cut. It's just the director's cut was put there for marketing. I think even Donner said, it's not really my director's cut. They just put it out. They just named it that to sell more DVDs. But I do like the director's cut more of the f first Lethal Weapon because the, the sniper scene. Hello, Mr. Sniper. That should have been in the movie. Should have been kept in the movie. It, it very fully showcase Riggs how far along he's gone but he had a pretty interesting and so many times now I've seen tributes and people talk about the first lethal weapon and nine times out of ten they always have that sniper scene in there so yeah to me it was a mistake to cut that out but yeah the lethal weapon sadly the the blu-rays are not the director's cuts which sucks they are the theatrical cuts I don't know why you don't put both of them I mean, they're in the additional scenes. Just put both of them on the fucking... Anyway, just put both of them on there. <clears throat> Again, just my thought process, my opinion on the matter. And real quick, like this box set. Uh, you have all four films. You have commentary. Richard Donner on each one. Trailer... Honeymoon Sweet Music Video, Deleted Scenes. There is a bonus disc. How Lethal Weapon Changed the Action Cinema's Landscape. Lethal Weapon and the Hollywood Monster Traded. So you're going to have new featurettes with new interviews with Richard Donner, Mel Gibson, and Danny Glover. But yeah, the first Lethal Weapon I, I put as my favorite Richard Donner film. Uh, number two, Scrooged. Because I do think this is more underrated than... I would say it was going to be Superman. But I'm like, you know what? Scrooge is a bit more underrated. No one ever talks about Scrooge. There is a Blu-ray, but there's like no features for it. Apparently, Richard Donner and Bill Murray did not get along with each other. And but that happens a lot with Bill Murray. He's a very talented guy, but he's very hard to work with, it seems. But it's a nice take on A Christmas Carol, the Ebenezer Scrooge, that whole tale, but done in a modern, very funny way with some pretty cool special effects. And uh, cynical, but entertaining <laughs> quality to it. And you have a, also, not just Bill Murray, but you have Bobcat Goldthwait, you have Karen Allen from Raiders of the Lost Ark and Starman, you got Robert Mitchum. You got Alfred Woodard. You got Carol Kane. Who beats the fuck out of Bill Murray.
Like I said, you have a pretty decent score by Danny Elfman, but you have a lot of talented people involved with this, and I think they did make money when it came out, but it just... Around Christmas time, I know there's a lot of other people that talk about Scrooged, and, but Sally, people involved with the film, they don't want to talk about it, and that's no special edition. I mean, this is Paramount, it's bare, oh, it's a trailer. I don't think the Blu-ray really has much. I mean, I like to pick up the Blu-ray sometime just to see in HD. But, you know, I didn't rush out for it. Just like, well, there's no features. That sucked. But they didn't to see in HD. Plus, I do like this cover more than the Blu-ray. Like, this cover, it's simple, but... It's more effective than the Blu-ray cover. At least it was the Blu-ray cover I'm thinking of. Anyway, Scrooge is an entertaining film. I mean, the opening alone, where Bill Murray shows the commercial that he wants to show. Violence. International terrorism. Drugs. Next, Ebenezer Scrooge. You must see it. You like me. me depend on it. I, I fucked it up, but I just... Just watching that alone, and just Bill Murray's performance, I have to kill all of you now. I, we just stop the goddamn hammering. We we can't get these antlers on the 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 things. Have you tried staples? What you gonna staple it? Yeah, if you haven't seen Scrooge, is a very, Scrooge is a very fun comedy. And what of Bill Murray's more underrated films? And yes, uh, do I like that or that more? You know what? Actually, you know what? I'm gonna make a different play. My third favorite is *Lethal Weapon* three. I love *Superman*, but like these are more my kind of films, action genre. And *Lethal Weapon* three I find to be more underrated because *Lethal Weapon* three kind of gets shit on. And gets disposed of. And I think it's a very fun sequel. It is my favorite sequel of the Lethal Weapon films. Uh, yes, the bad guy could be improved. I don't know if it... It's not a bad actor, but there's just... There's barely any stream time with the villain to give meat to the bones. But I do like the addition of Rene Russo. Joel Pesci is fun to see him back on it. I love the way it opens with the bomb... We only had a catastrophe. Raj, get the cat. Get the cat. And they asked to blow up the. They asked him to blow up the fucking building. I mean, that's an explosive way to open your film. And I like the subplot of the guns, and it gave Murtaugh a little bit of meat to the bones where he had to kill a kid who was his son's friend. I thought that had. Some nice dramatic moments for Danny Glover to play off of. And uh, there's a lot of fun moments. There's a bit where Murtaugh is drunk. And Danny Glover has the gun. And Mel Gibson's like, what, you don't shoot me? And so Mel Gibson takes his finger and puts in the gun. And Danny Glover doesn't know what they're really saying, so he's like... You better get your finger on my bow. I'm going to get my gun. He's already got the gun. It's... I, I think it's a very entertaining film. I like the idea of the bullets that go through body, arm, body armor. Uh, I like the ending. I think... Lethal Weapon 3, for me, had a more consistent tone. Where it is a lighter tone. But that lighter tone, even with the, the subplot with the... Weapon to Roger Murtaugh... It had a more consistent tone. And the first film's a darker film. And that had a more consistent tone. Lethal Weapon 2 is in my top 10. But it's lower down the list. Because I like Lethal Weapon 2. But it just the tone is weird for me. Because it starts off. Yeah we're having this car chase. Oh come on. Wait. Uh, you don't have enough room. And very like fun. And you know. Getting the bomb. And getting off the toilet. And. But then the switcheroo of all their cop 
buddies are getting murdered, and then Ridge is dr almost drowned, and the girl that he likes is fucking dead, and then he goes ape shit, and now he's suic he's just fucking death wish, and then he was supposed to die. It seems like he's going to die, but he doesn't really die. And then Joe Pesci's getting tortured. It's like it's a not a one eighty, but it's like it's a very almost breaking my neck change in tone they just it doesn't fit right for me i still like the film but i like one in three more for that reason and because there were issues with shane black and changing the script i think that did result in the kind of wanty tone shifts for me which is funny too is there's a deleted scene lethal weapon 2 where she uh the girl actually lived i forgot her name Patty Tensit. Which I don't know how that would have worked. I guess they would have cut that scene out. Like the whole finale seems pretty adamant on that. Uh, so, But yeah, there's a deleted ending where Patty Tensit's alive. I'm like, how the hell would that work? She was pretending to be dead. Doing a impression underwater. But yeah, Lethal Weapon 3 I, I do enjoy. So that's my third one. What, Lethal Weapon 1, Scrooge. Lethal Weapon 3... And then Superman. What can I say about Superman the movie? It's one of the best superhero films out there. Again, these are more my kind of action films than superhero movies. That's why this is a bit lower. Also, the ending with Going Around the World. I complained about that when I did the commentary. That's the one big... I got the red ass on that. As in, my ass bleeds for that whole ending of just... Well, he goes around the world, if he could do that and go back through time, why the fuck does he just do that all the fucking time? There's not really anything saying that he can't do that all the time. And Well, wait a minute, he turned back time and everything went back in reverse, but then Lois Lane's complaining about the telephone poles falling down as if it did get hit, but it didn't get hit. Like, it did get hit, that's why the telephone poles are coming down, but it didn't get hit, so it, there's no cave and she didn't die. And it's like, well, wait a minute, why is it that some of it happened and some of it didn't? Because when the missile hit, it did this rupture where the telephone lines almost hit Lois Lane's car and then the cave-in, but then only some of that happened? Some of, I just, the whole thing's confusing because that wasn't what the ending was supposed to be. That was supposed to be the ending of Superman 2. They said, put on this one in case there's no part two. I think that was a mistake. I really do think that was a mistake. I think it fucked the film up a bit, but... Uh, I well directed it has a great sense of magic especially in the first half whether it be the mysterious personification of Krypton with all the crystals and crystal and crystallized environment was very unique and then the sweeping shots of old school Americana great sweeping shot of the cornfields and as uh, Clark Kent's gonna go on his destiny has some really great emotional moments you know, with all those powers I couldn't save him which worked a lot better than talk to the hand Clark I know you just save me because you're faster than a speeding bullet but uh, just to save your identity I will be swept away by a tornado because shit happens I mean fuck he's so fast you could back, you could sneak away. Oh, I got picked up by tornado, but hey, I landed fine. Shit, sometimes that happens. There's all sorts of bullshit you come up with. Give me a fucking break. Fuck Man of Steel. But you know, Christopher Reeve, Christopher Reeve does a great job as Superman. He personified the role. Gene Hackman, Ned Beatty, Otis Berg, Otis Berg. And of course, a beautiful score by John Williams. Can't say enough about Superman the movie. Except that ending bugs the fuck on me. I can't help it. And then number five would be The Goonies. One more could be said about The Goonies. A very entertaining adventure. It showcases that just because kids star in a film doesn't mean it has to be a dumb kids movie. Uh, I think Richard Donner... Because he produced the film, he directed the film, he directed these kids. 
on how to act. He did get a good cast, whether it be Sean Astin, whether it be Corey Feldman, whether it be uh, Josh Brolin, even the the criminals, Robert Davi, Joel Petigliano. Very likable group of people, and... It has a nice sense of adventure that you as a kid wish you would have gone into an adventure like this. Despite the danger, despite the booby traps. There's that part of you that wishes you experienced this adventure when you were a kid. And it had a great sense of... Mythology is a big word to use on it, but I like the one-eyed willy, the background of the gold, and again, the different varieties of booby traps and how they led from A to B to C. And I say the cast works very well. And Richard Dodd did a nice job keeping these actors and kids in check. Instead of just having temper tantrums and doing whatever the fuck they want. So. I also credit to Dave Grusin who did the score. Which, that's a name that I'm not familiar with and what other scores he did. But this is a score that... We, I can't tell you how many movie trailers after this would use the score for Goonies. But dun, 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 dun. Yeah, very fun adventure film. And like I said, a show tease just because it's a kid's film doesn't mean it has to be a lame ass piece of shit. Like Michael Bay's Ninja Turtle films. There's number five. Number six. I had to think about it for a minute. And I'm going to say Conspiracy Theory. Yeah, I like this film. I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. It's not great. But I think it's a tad underrated. I like the idea of Mel Gibson as this guy who has all these crazy conspiracy theories. And lo and behold, one of them came true. And then you learn a little bit of background as to Mel Gibson's character. Why he's so off and so weird. Uh, I liked him and Julia Roberts' chemistry. Also, you yeah, got Patrick Stewart as the villain. It's well directed in his action sequences. I mean, by this point, Donner had worked with Bell on the Lethal Weapon 1, 2, and 3, and Maverick. And uh, Mel Gibson is probably the guy Donner worked with the most. Sally Richard Donner. Never worked with Arnold. He did work with... A I, I forgot he worked with Stallone and Assassins. That's right. Hmm. But yeah. Well, now I wonder... Does I have Assassins over here? I keep forgetting about that. Which, 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 which one? Man, I'm a, I like Stallone. I like Antonio Banderas. Although there is some issues with pacing. Because it did not need to be over two hours long. But I do like the film. Okay. Hmm, fuck. God, see, see, now I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Shit. Stallone, Mel Gibson. I like Stallone more, and Antonio Banderas is fun, but I would say the story's a bit stronger in this. Right now, I'm going to say this one for now, because again, I think the story is a bit more interesting, the, the thriller aspect. It's been a while since I've seen this, too, so maybe it's one of those I have to watch again. Because again, the, the two things about this is the pacing's a bit too long, and Julianne Moore. I don't mind Julianne Moore, but at the same time, I. I would honestly prefer she not be in the film and just these two guys mano a mano, but you know, hunting each other. And this one is, it's over two hours as well, but I don't remember feeling the length in this movie. So yeah, I'll put this above it for now. 
And actually, then I, it would be this one, Maverick. Because I do like Maverick. I'm not even a big Western guy, but I do like Maverick. Like I said, this time, Donner was making longer and longer movies. Like, both of these movies are over two hours long. And I'm not like a big card game type of individual where I watch people gamble with cards. I don't watch that in real life. It's something I barely watch in movies. There are movies I can deal with, like Rounders. And this one, because there's a fun sense of humor to it. James Garner, Jodie Foster, Danny Glover, nice cameo. You also have James Colburn, Alfred Molina. There's some entertaining bits of comedy. At least the, the finale with the card game is interspersed with some entertaining moments that dip away. And I remember Randy Newman's score being joyful. And uh, yeah, I do remember liking Maverick pretty, pretty decently. I think it's only a, a tad lower than Conspiracy Theory because I said I like West. There are westerns I enjoy: Young Guns, High Plains Drifter, Man with No Name trilogy. But westerns are not my first or second cup of tea. But there are westerns I enjoy. Uh, but modern you know, action thrills are a little bit more my cup of tea. I would say my favorite western is Young Guns, which is western but has that modern feel and score. Because of the cast, what I mean by modern feel. Anyway, uh, Maverick, I remember being a, a fun one. So, yeah, it'd be Lethal Weapon, Scrooge, Lethal Weapon 3, the uh, Superman, The Goonies, Conspiracy Theory, Maverick. Then I would go with Lethal Weapon 2. Because I, I do like the film. Joe Pesci as Leo Getz. Anything you want? Leo Getz. They, they fuck you in the drive. They fuck you. They fuck you. They fuck you. Do enjoy that. Bill Gibson and Danny Love still work fairly well together. There's some nice lines of dialogue. Diplomatic immunity. Just been revolt. <laughs> That's pretty badass. I do like the musical motif of knocking on heaven's door in the third act. Though it's very softer, subtle version of it. I really did like that motif. So I do like Lethal Weapon too. So that's definitely on the list. So that would be number eight. And so, hmm, number nine. I'll put Assassins. I am a bit Stallone fan. I just not a big fan of what he's done the past ten years, but I'm a bit Stallone fan. I do like him. I do like Antonio Banderas. I like their. Uh, it's hell a lot better than Expendables three, which is the next time they team together. There's some decent action bits, but nothing remarkable. Sally, I say it's a bit too long. I mean, this is 133 minutes. That's two hours and 13 minutes. No reason for it to be that long. I agree with Stallone's assessment. He said in an interview that the film seemed like it played a little bit too safe. It could have been a bit more edgy. Because they are assassins. At least, you know, Antonio to be... You know, you didn't need the Julianne Moore stuff. You didn't need Stallone protecting Julianne Moore... It's, and it's not that I dislike Julian Moore, but it's just that was the lesser, least, that was the less interesting part of the story. The most interesting is these two guys facing off against each other. And Miguel, Miguel Bain wanted to be number one. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite Antonio Banderas roles. I do like his character. So, yeah, I remember this film came out and not doing that well. And it's grown a little bit on me throughout the years compared to the shit he's done past 10 years for Sly, but it's not one of my favorites, but it, I don't mind it. And number 10, it's a choice between these two. Because I do like both of these movies. Put them over here in case I have a picture there. I always forget. 
So probably last I was doing this, what the fuck are you lo when I was doing that? Yeah, I know. I always I tee for the end. Sometimes I have a picture over there. Maybe I won't for this. I don't know. But which of these for number ten? I don't know. Because I like each one. I probably have to go with the toy. Uh, I do like the film. It's not my favorite Richard Pryor. That would be see no evil, hear no evil. Uh, but I do like the movie. I think Richard Pryor is fairly fun. Yes, he's a bit more censored because this is PG. But I thought he had some nice interactions with the kid. I thought there were still nice funny moments. Richard Pryor... It's one of those movies that's weird to talk about because old people always bring up the fact it's racist, it's racist. I'm like, well... I just don't see... I, I get what people are coming from, but... They do mention in the movie that... This is a bit of a weird situation... I do think it's more about the story. Like, if you took the same movie and it was, this was a white guy, would anyone have any beef with it? No. If that's the case, then are we judging it? Like, he can't play this role because he's black. Again, isn't that kind of counterintuitive? I don't know if I'm making sense. I believe I did review this film. I believe it's up on the channel. I think this did decent at the box office. Jackie Gleason was was decent in it. There is a line from this movie that I've always stolen ever since I first heard it. Where Richard Pryor's given this kid Scott Schwartz a lesson. Oh, it's not fair. And then Richard Pryor's like, oh, wow, look, life isn't fair. Well, tough titties. <laughs> and I've said that. I might have said that in reviews. So anytime you hear me go, tough titties, it's from this movie. I stole it from Richard Pryor in this movie. It's like, uh, Richard Pryor here and now, bullshit my dick. Bullshit my dick. From that stand-up. I'm a big Richard Pryor fan. He is my favorite stand-up comedian. He's one of my favorite comedians in general. See no, see no evil, see no evil, hear no evil, like I said, is one of my favorite comedies of all time. And even films deemed his lesser ones, I still have quite a bit of fun with it. So, that will be number 10. Um, I don't mind this film. I think Bruce Willis does a really good job. I like the idea. This seems like an idea they fucking ripped off for that sh shitty Mark Wahlberg film. Mile 22. That plot sounds like the plot to this. <laughs> Not exactly the plot. Not exactly, but... I might, uh, I'd rather watch this. And that, sadly, this is, the, I think, the last film Richard Donner did. Because he did Timeline, which I'm not a fan of. I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of Timeline. Could never get into it. And then he did this movie. I think that was it. This was around 2006? I was going to say 2003. I think 2006. The biggest issue is most deaf. Which he was a decent actor in other movies, but he gives this weird voice. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. I mean, I need to go get my... I gotta make my cake. I gotta make my cake, man. I gotta, it's like a... Is he trying to do an impression of Eric Cartman from South Park? Or... I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on. I gotta go here. I gotta get my cake, man. I don't... Man. Well, the... F I, it, either don't have that performance or get a different actor. Get a different actor... And I think this would have been greatly improved. But as it is, I do like the film. And Bruce Willis, I think, does a rather good job in this. And I do think there's some nice excitement. And you know, I, I at least root for his character. And his redemption arc. And the idea is... To get through 16 blocks while being hunted by dirty cops. One of them played by David Morse. Who's this guy here. It was in Disturbia and many other movies. So, I guess really that's 11. <laughs> now that is top 11 Richard Donner films. So, rest in peace, Mr. Richard Donner.
and uh, we will see you guys later. Bye-bye.